Time's a funny thing, isn't it? I really can't believe that we're already starting the Advent season and the Christmas season already. And 2024 is right around the corner. I mean, I really can't believe we're about to be in the year 2024. Time just seems to go faster and faster the older we get. And, you know, it, it's been said that life is not measured by time. Life is measured in moments. Life is not measured by time. Life is measured in moments. And, I just finished with C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and he talked about that a little bit in that book. But as I pondered that, and as I really thought about it, I, I, I said, you know what? Like, yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I believe that statement is true in many ways. You know, because you rarely remember a whole year, or a whole month, or a whole week, or even a whole day. We typically only remember certain moments from our lives. You know, like, for example, I don't remember this past week, but I'll remember coming to the Scotty Christmas concert tonight. Or I'll remember decorating the church yesterday and maybe some things from that. I'll remember, uh, I won't remember the past month or the past week. You know, there are moments in the past I can tell you, I, I can't tell you the month or the day, but I, I can remember the moment. I remember my last walk with my dad in Holly. I remember... Uh, walked with Luther in Rush Pond, seeing a couple of deer. We saw a turkey one day. Um, as my grandfather was dying of cancer, I remember telling him uh, that I was going in the Marine Corps. And what he said to me, he said, uh, you do what, what you think is right. I remember the moment I saw that rattlesnake, <laughs> you know? Life is not always measured by time. It's often measured by moments. And today, we're starting a new series for Advent called Holy Moments. We're going to look at four specific holy moments in the story of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to open up this message series today, we're going to look at a very powerful moment of obedience with one key thought. And here's the thing. The moment you hear it might be the moment that God starts to do a work in your life. And so the, the key thought is this. Are you ready? You have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. You have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. And some of you know that because at one time in the past, you were prompted to do something or to say something or to give something, and you did something or you said something or you gave something. And you look back and you're like, wow, I cannot believe all that God set into motion because of that one small act of obedience, that one small moment of obedience that I have. And here's the reality of it. There are times when we might feel prompted to say something, to do something, to give something, but we don't know all the details. And the act of obedience seems very, very difficult and hard. And so we don't do it. And then sometime in the future, we look back on that moment and we say, well, what did we miss out on? What did God plan to do that maybe he didn't do through us because we didn't obey? And that's why the title of today's message is When It's Hard to Obey. So we're going to dive into this special portion of the Christmas story that we read earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. And it starts out in verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, chances are pretty good that most, if not all of you, have heard of Mary, right? You're familiar with Mary. You have the Virgin Mary. Mary gets all the stage time. Mary gets all the sermons. But today I want to talk to you about Joseph, who is one of the most important yet least talked about characters in the Bible. And one of the reasons for that is probably because it appears that he died at an early age. He did not live to his, uh, the, the lifespan of a typical man on that time. And another reason is because uh, there's not a lot about him in the Bible. We don't know a whole lot about him in Scripture. But, uh, so, so there aren't any sermons about him. But let, let me just take a moment. See what I did there? Let me take a moment and uh, 
let's look at what we do know from Scripture today about Joseph. We know that he was a carpenter. We know that he was a righteous and faithful man. Uh, we know that he was a descendant of King David. We know that he was betrothed or engaged to Mary, and eventually he became Mary's husband. And we know he was the earthly father of Jesus and Mary's other children, uh, Jesus' siblings. Outside of that, we hardly know anything at all about him. But we do know that one moment of obedience helped bring about a change that impacts all of us, even today. When we look at Joseph, to see him in Scripture, uh, we do see a little bit of him in the early part of Jesus' life, in his early years. The last time he's mentioned is, is when Jesus is 12 years of age. And then he seems to disappear from the story. And that's why most scholars believe that he likely died, because he probably would not have divorced. If he had, they would have mentioned that in Scripture. Um, and uh, also the fact that Jesus stayed home uh, until he was 30. And uh, there were no video games back then, so he wasn't living in mom's basement, living off of mom, right? Um, it, we know that uh, it was actually the tradition in that culture for if your mom was a widow, that you would stay in the household until she was, until you were 30 years old. Um, and then we also know that when Jesus was on the cross, he looked to his beloved disciple, uh, John, and said, essentially, would you take care of my mom? So that's more evidence that she was a widow. Now, in the context of our story, our scripture reading today, Joseph was engaged or betrothed to Mary. And unlike today in our culture, where typically the earliest you see somebody get engaged is you know around 18 years old. And that's that's early, right? I mean, especially today. Most people are waiting for their 20s and 30s now. Um, but, but Mary was probably, and most scholars agree, she's probably 14 or 15. And some would say that she was even as young as 13 years old, which was very, very young. Uh, but that's how they did it in the Middle East back then. And she was a virgin, and Joseph finds out she's pregnant. And we don't know the details of how he finds out she's pregnant. Uh, whether she told him or whether he figured it out after she returns from her relatives, Elizabeth's. Uh, you know, she was there for three months, so I'm sure when she came back, she probably had a baby bump, right? And so one way or another, he figures it out. Between Matthew's and Luke's uh, gospel accounts, we don't know for sure. But we do know he finds out and he's not happy about it. And who, who could blame him, right? I'm sure he was devastated beyond measure. And probably even more so than we might imagine. Because if you understand the first century Jewish engagement culture, when you got engaged, it wasn't just a you know proposal for an Instagram or Facebook moment. Right? When, you, when you were betrothed, you were technically married. Uh, it was a legal agreement. And you just weren't allowed to consummate the marriage until after the public ceremony. So when we read they were betrothed, you know, in our culture, we would say they were married, but just temporarily celibate. And so if Mary had sex with another man, this was a life-ruining scandal. Mary, the one he loved, the, with all of his heart, his future wife, the one that would raise his kids, she had disobeyed God, she had dishonored her family, and she had disgraced Joseph, who would be laughed at, mocked at, and shunned. It was considered such a horrible sin that according to Deuteronomy 22, he could have her stoned to death. Now, that didn't happen a whole lot, but it was legal. That was the law. What was more common would have been he would have brought her to the city council and they would have found her guilty and that would have cleared his name. Unfortunately, when that happened to a woman back in that culture at that time, she was basically left to prostitution to support herself. Um, so Joseph was in a horrible place. The woman of his dreams had apparently betrayed him, and now his next actions would either end her life or ruin her life even more than it already was. But we know he was a righteous man, and he didn't want to disgrace her. As hurt and as devastated as he was, 
he did not want to shame this woman that he loved. And so he thought about breaking off the betrothal. In our culture, we would say divorcing her quietly or putting her away secretly. And what Joseph didn't realize was is that at his lowest moment, it was about to become one of his holiest moments. In verse 20, but as he considered these things, as he thought about divorcing her quietly, breaking off the engagement, the betrothal, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Now, before we look at what Joseph did, I want to just point out what he didn't do. The angel says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And what Joseph didn't do is he didn't write it off as just a dream. He didn't say, ah, oh, that was a weird dream. Hope I don't have that one again. Or, you know, he didn't say anything like, oh, I ate pizza a little bit too late last night. I gave me bad dreams. You know, he didn't, he didn't argue with God, saying, wait a minute. You ask me to put my name and my reputation on the line all for a dream? I'm not going to do that. He didn't try to negotiate with God, say, give me another sign, which that one hits me right here, right between the eyes, because when I called the ministry, that's exactly what I did. I said, give me another sign, Lord, because I'm not sure I can do this. So you can just turn to your neighbor and say, Pastor's no Joseph. <laughs> No, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't fight back. He didn't ask for more details. You know, I, I'm going to do this, Lord. I, I don't even know what's going to happen. He didn't do that. When the angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, verse 24, when he woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife. When Joseph woke from sleep. He did as the angel commanded him. Now, if there was one statement that we were not true for all of us, that would be we did what God commanded us to do. We were obedient. Without understanding any of the details to come. And that was true in my story. I was obedient. And I didn't know any of the details. Now I did argue with God. And I did ask for another sign. Okay? So I'm not Joseph or by any stretch. But I was obedient from the very start. Joseph really proves this thought, though, and that's that you don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. You don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. You don't need every single detail. You don't need everything ironed out. You don't need to know how it's going to end if God is there in the beginning. I mean, think about all the things Joseph didn't know. He didn't know that in nine months of her being pregnant, that there was going to come a government decree that he was going to have to go to Bethlehem for a census. And they were going to have to travel 100 miles on a donkey with a nine-month pregnant woman. There would be wild animals. There could be robbers. And then he didn't know that a baby would be born in a cave next to farm animals. He didn't know that Herod, the king, would issue a decree that all the male children under two years old would be killed, and they would have to go on the run. They'd have to flee to Egypt. Imagine the weight of knowing all those male children were dead because of your child who was saved. Joseph had no idea of the weight and magnitude of raising the Son of God. But without knowing any details, Joseph obeyed immediately. And this is how it will apply to you. At some point, God's going to speak to you through his word or through another person. Or he's going to prompt you by his spirit. And he's going to lead you to do something without knowing the details. And it may even sound like something crazy. You know, a complete career change. Uh, you had a plan for your life and, and you were going in one direction and God says, nope, I want you to go that way. And you're you've invested time and money and blood and sweat and tears. But God prompts you to do something. And the question is, do you obey or do you not obey? God's been stirring within you to use your gifts within the church. Because uh, we don't just go to church, right? We are the church. And uh, we all have gifts that are all important to the body of Christ. And we're all part of the kingdom. 
and then we should all be part of the body of Christ. Where uh, God prompts you to do something and, and you say, uh, you know, God, I'm pretty busy. Uh, I got to scroll through Facebook for the next couple hours, and I got a show I got to finish binge watching, and there's a book over there I got to read. You just don't serve whatever it is that you do. Okay? And God prompts you, or God might need you to give something, to bless somebody. I was a recipient of that once. We had a bill we didn't know how we were going to pay, and all of a sudden we got a check in the mail and paid the bill. Somebody followed God's obedience. You know, you're thinking, oh, when my budget's really tight, gas is so expensive, inflation is going through the roof, stocks are down. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Or maybe somebody betrays you. And God's word pierces your heart. That we're to forgive others as he has forgiven us. And you have a choice to make. It may be hard for you. You may not know the details that God's prompting you. And, and, and you don't know what's going to happen. And that's why I would encourage you to remember that obedience is our responsibility and the outcome is God's. Obedience is our responsibility, but the outcome is God's. We do what he asks us to do, and we trust him with the results. Unfortunately, in our culture, one of our biggest problems, and I call this cultural Christianity, many Christians in the Western world are what I would call educated beyond their level of obedience. Right? They know, uh, they have all this head knowledge, but not a life application. Uh, you know, they, they constantly looking to be fed, but they never apply what they've learned. In fact, there are many Christians who probably don't need to learn more, they just need to do more. We need to be obedient to what God has already said. To start with obedience to his revealed word to what he says in scripture, to know it, to know his word, and then to apply it to our lives without knowing all the details. We just obey God and trust him with the results. Now, Joseph didn't have any of the details. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And the angel continued, and he said this, and this is so powerful. He said, for that which is conceived in her, for that, you know, the child Mary's carrying, is from the Holy Spirit. Spirit, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, in case you were drifting off, because we're getting toward the end of the service, and you're thinking about lunch, or what you're going to do this afternoon, or the Sky Family concert tonight, let me just say this again. Well, the baby that Mary's carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and that that boy, that son, Jesus, that's going to be born is going to save us from our sin. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that it was a miraculous, holy birth conceived by the Holy Spirit, a virgin birth? If this child had been conceived by an earthly father, he would have been born into sin. Sin passes from man to man, to man, to man, right? He would have been, had a sinful seed nature. And, but because he did not inherit that sin nature of man, but instead inherited the spiritual nature of God, he was born without sin. He could live without sin. And he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sin, for the sin of the world. I don't know about you, but I need grace. I need forgiveness. There's nothing that you have done or can do that is beyond God's grace that he won't forgive you for. Jesus was born in a virgin without sin so he could die for us. So we could have our sins forgiven. And an angel says, do not be afraid to take her as your wife. And he just obeys, knowing that there's going to be significant cost to him. He's going to face serious opposition. And any time, pretty much every time, that God prompts you, and he gives you a word, he gives you a direction, he speaks to you through his word, he speaks to you through his spirit, and he directs you, almost every time you're going to face spiritual opposition. I certainly did. I paid a huge price. 
but just in general. When I'm obedient every single time, there's spiritual opposition. But look at the outcome of being obedient. And I'm going to close with this. Joseph was obedient. And over 2,000 years later, that baby, the son of God, was raised by a loving earthly father who taught him how to be a carpenter, how to respect his mother, how to go to synagogue on the Sabbath every, every Sabbath. He, uh, he was obedient. He kept that child alive. When there was a hit put out on him, fleeing to Egypt, that boy grew up and changed the world. He changed each and every one of you here. Not just who we are and what we believe as his disciples, but our eternal destiny. So don't worry when you face opposition for your obedience to God. Obedience will be hard. Obedience will be difficult. There will be opposition that may even cost you something. But you have no idea what our God can do. Through one moment of obedience, you have no idea what our God can do through one moment of obedience. And the angel said, Do not be afraid to take her as your wife. And Joseph did as the angel commanded. A moment. Life isn't measured just by time, it's measured by moments. You have no idea what God might do through one moment of obedience today. Amen. Amen. Amen.